Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Mary Kulloff, the President of the Royal Society of Tasmania, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to today's webinar presented by Dr. Eloise Fu. This is a very special lecture for us because it's the MR Banks Medal Lecture. This is an award that the Society awards every few years to a mid-career Tasmanian researcher in any field. It has to be an outstanding researcher and last year for the first time in the history of the medal, the Honours Committee was unable to separate the, the top two nominees. So Dr. Eloise Fu and Associate Professor Arco Lucia were the co-winners of the 2019 MR Banks Medal. And this is the first of those two lectures. We're very pleased that so many members and supporters are able to join us today. Our patron, Professor the Honourable Kate Warner, Governor of Tasmania, and Mr Richard Warner are not able to be with us today, and they send their best wishes to all participants. In beginning this webinar, I pay respect to the traditional and original owners of the land upon we, which we meet today, the Muanina people, to pay respects to those who have passed before us and to Tasmania's Aboriginal community who are today's custodians of the land. For this webinar, your Zoom chat facility is turned off. You will be able to ask questions at the end of the lecture by typing them in using the Q&A button that you can see at the bottom of your Zoom screen. This lecture is being recorded and it will be placed on our Royal Society of Tasmania YouTube channel. There'll be a link to that from our homepage, our Royal Society webpage. I'll give you that link later on and it will be there in about a week. So it's my pleasure now to introduce our speaker, Associate Professor Eloise Fu. Eloise completed her PhD in plant developmental genetics at the University of Queensland before moving to UTAS to work with Professor Jim Reid and Associate Professor Weller examining how light influences plant development. She was subsequently awarded two independent fellowships from the ARC at UTAS and established a new research area examining the role of plant hormones in plant microbe symbiosis. She has been chief investigator on two large ARC discovery grants and is a member of the recently funded ARC Centre of Excellence in Plant Success, an Australia-wide research group looking to harness the power of plants for improving agricultural and ecological outcomes. Eloise lectures in plant biology and genetics, leads a research group and is an active member of Equity and Diversity Activities at UTAS. She is a member of the Australian Society of Plant Scientists and in 2018 was awarded the inaugural ASPS Jan Anderson Award for the most outstanding early career female in plant science in Australia. So we're very much looking forward to your talk, Eloise. Congratulations on winning the MI Banks Medal 2019. And Eloise is going to talk to us today on a very fascinating topic. I have to say the title sounds especially fascinating. Her talk is entitled Dating in the Dark, the Underground World of Beneficial Plant Microbe Relationships. Thank you, Eloise. Thanks so much, Mary. And thanks to the Society for giving me this opportunity to speak to everyone today. So as Mary said, I arrived in Tasmania in 2004 and I've really made Tasmania um, our home. Um, it's been a fantastic place uh, to establish a research career, but also to have a family. So I've been really um, fortunate to be able to combine my research career um, with the family as well. So today I'm gonna to talk to you about this hidden um, underground world um, that um, is, is going on beneath our feet all the time. Um, and it's still somewhat mysterious and that's why it's still very much an active area of research. So when we think about plants, we might think about them being individuals, but actually most plants have very intimate relationships uh, with bacteria and fungi, which is what I'm going to talk to you about today. And it's a little bit like we're now understanding the human gut microbe is a really intrinsic part of human health. Um, the microbes that are on the surface and inside plants are equally important for plant health and ultimately also for animal health. So today I'm going to give you a pretty um, a broad overview of the, of the research area. It is a large area um, and to get, sort of give you that big picture view. And so a lot of the work I will talk about won't necessarily be my own work, but I will highlight some areas of, of research that our group's been doing. And I'll, I'll let you know when I'm talking about um, work that relates to that. But don't, don't think that all the things that I'm going to talk to you about today have come from my research. 
<clears throat> so we know um, nutrients are really an important factor for plant growth. Um, we know that uh, if we grow plants um, in the absence of the adequate nutrients that they need, they really can't um, perform in the way that we want them to. And two of the nutrients that are really important, that are really these, these big um, nutrients that are important for plant growth are nitrogen and phosphorus. So we know plants need these nutrients in, in good supply. And um, we've been very good in the past um, in agriculture at um, accommodating that need by applying fertilizer. And we've been able to get some really amazing um, increases in plant production by the application of, of synthetic fertilizer. Um, but this fertilizer has its um, negatives as well. So it's, it's an expensive way to add nutrient. Um, it's often, it's in limited supply. It's very energy intensive to produce and to apply. And actually much of the nutrients we apply actually runs off and um, runs into waterways where it can do all sorts of damage. So maybe we could look um, to other ways that plants can be accessing nutrients. So we can think of um, symbiosis, which is this beneficial relationship between uh, two organisms as, as a kind of response that plants have naturally needed nutrients and they've teamed up with microbes to help them out with that. So we can think plants, here we've got a pea plant, which is a uh, organism that I do work on quite a bit. And we can see the roots, this hidden part that we often don't see. And that's where nutrients are being taken up. So as I mentioned, phosphorus and nitrogen being really important. But plants actually have other ways of accessing nutrients. So they can form relationships with fungi, so arbuscular mycorrhizal symbiosis, which I'll talk about in more detail. And, that relation, and they can also form a relationship with bacteria leading to nodulation. And the mycorrhizal symbiosis on the top there, that fungal relationship where it um, extends the root system of the plant, that can be really important for a way for plants to access phosphorus. And that bottom one I'm showing you there, nodulation, where the plants um, interact with bacteria, that can be um, another way that plants can actually get access to nitrogen that it needs for growth. So I'm gonna go into detail on, on both of these. So if you think about that really um, a high level thinking where we know plants have all sorts of um, uh, needs, they need sunlight and carbon dioxide to, to fix um, carbon into a form um, into sugars. Um, they need water and they need these nutrients. And we can see at the top there on that little pyramid of, of needs, nitrogen being really important and also uh, phosphorus there being really important for plant growth. So like I said, plants uh, can be single and loving it. If there's enough nutrients available in the soil, uh, they can access that nutrient directly. Um, but often that's not the, not the um, situation that plants find themselves in. We can see here a little tomato plant with its roots growing down in the soil. And there's only so much soil that, that, that uh, root, those roots can, can explore and mine for nutrients. So you can see a little, a little superimposed there. That's really just the, that's the volume of soil that that plant can get access to. So actually, in most situations, plants might need a bit more help to get the nutrients they need to really thrive. So as we mentioned um, in agriculture, we've really um, uh, tried to accommodate this by applying excess nutrients. So that little bit of soil the plants can um, access um, is packed full of the nutrients that we know the plant needs. But as we mentioned, this can have some really um, terrible effects for the environment. So um, particularly um, runoff, nutrient runoff and eutrophication of waterways is one that I think a lot of people are familiar with. So a lot of that nutrient isn't access, isn't really being taken up by the plant. It's, it's running off into waterways and doing all sorts of other damage. So let's look to the way that um, uh, some actual uh, ways through evolution that plants have actually um, gained access to the nutrients they need. <clears throat> so we can really think about it at a high level by thinking that we've got a plant here that's really looking um, for another way to access nutrients. It's, it's only exploring so much of the soil and it really needs to find uh, another way to, to get the nutrients that it needs. So this plant is actually sending out signals out into the soil to actually um, uh, search out a partner that can help it. And in this case, a fungal partner. So this is just, um, we can imagine the plants um, sending out these messages. And this is actually what it does. And this is part of some of the research that I've been looking into is how does the plant um, attract the right partner to help it out? So we actually now know that um, a plant hormone called strigolactones, which is a little bit of a mouthful, but it's actually quite a simple molecule that the plants produce. And the roots are actually exuding this chemical messenger out into the soil and actually calling out for a partner to help it out with um, accessing nutrients. And actually we know that there's um, 
fungal partners out there willing and able to team up with plants. So these are mycorrhizal fungi that I mentioned to you before. So this is a fungi that's um, really important. It really needs to find a plant partner. The only way it can survive is if it finds a plant partner to provide the carbon that it needs. And this, um, this is showing a spore, which is the resting state. But with the, the fungi is actually this very fine hyphal network. So it's a really excellent way of collecting nutrients, especially phosphorus, these little fine hyphae can explore a lot more of the soil um, than the plant roots could. And like I said, this is saying, contact me ASCP, I literally can't survive without you. The fungi actually can't survive without the plant. The plant is the way that it provides, um, gets its carbon. So it's a match made in heaven, really. We've got a plant that needs um, nutrient and we've got a fungi that needs carbon. So the two team up. And in, the, in exchange, I've just talked to you about the plant signal that's being sent out, the strigolactones, which are the calling card that the fungi can detect. And in exchange, we now know that the fungi is sending out its own signals, um, which is even more of a mouthful than strigolactones, but these lipokyto oligosaccharides, these are quite um, complicated molecules that, that identify the fungi as being a friend rather than a foe. Because it's really important that when the plant does form these relationships, that um, they know these relationships are with a, a fungi that will be beneficial to the plant. Um, certainly not an open door policy of letting, letting it just anybody in. So, and we know now that these signals are quite ancient and have, um, are really the basis of the start of any good relationship is, is always based on communication. And the relationship between the fungi and the plant, it's absolutely based on this correct communication. So um, this is actually a really ancient um, symbiosis. So we think that this actually, as plants evolved and moved onto land and they needed to form roots, they actually formed uh, mycorrhizal symbiosis. So we think it might be more than 450 million years ago. So now we can see a panel on the left, our little, a little lonely plant with this only so much of the soil that it can um, uh, explore. And now we've got that middle plant, which is doing much better because the fungal uh, mycorrhizal network is extending the root system out into that soil and able to gather up all sorts of nutrients that the plant uh, wouldn't be able to access on its own. So this is a symbiosis, it's beneficial. We've got the nutrients coming in from the fungi and the carbon that that plant is producing for its own growth. Some of that is actually giving over to the fungi in exchange. So it's, not a, it's certainly a give and take relationship but when it's um, balanced correctly, both partners are benefiting. And here's a little photo. It's, 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 um, it's not a, an, a something that you can see easily. So although this is happening uh, all around us, almost all the plants we can see around us have this extended root system with these fine hyphae, uh, it's almost impossible to see uh, with your eye, which is quite frustrating. So I can't, um, although this photo shows these fine network of hyphae, um, this is not something that I've ever actually seen myself. It's something that we only see when we, we stay in the roots. So this is actually some pictures of some roots that are colonised by mycorrhizal fungi, and they've actually just been stained with ink. Um, it's a really simple way to see the, um, the roots and the fungal structures. So the fungal structures in this picture are shown up in blue, and we have the root running through the middle of the picture. On the top there, you can see a little spore and a little hyphae extending out and actually um, penetrating. And then all through the root system, you can see these blue structures. So if we blow up where the, um, the top of the root there, where the fungi actually penetrates, you can see these little um, structures where the, the fungi is actually puncturing the root, um, but not doing damage to the plant. This is all happening in complete um, uh, synergy with the plant. The plant is actually accommodating the fungi and then what we see, um, which are really beautiful little fungal structures called arbuscles, and that's where the name arbuscular mycorrhizal symbiosis comes from. So these are like a little tree-like structure where the fungi um, has lots of little hyphae that are branching, and this is inside the plant root cell. And this is where they're exchanging nutrients. So the plant is giving carbon and in exchange nutrients, which are being collected up by that fine hyphal network out in the soil is being funneled into the plant through these beautiful little structures. And I always get a bit of a thrill still when I see them down the microscope because they are this sort of hidden world. Another form of mycorrhizae, a little different, not one that I work on, but also an important one um, in, um, in ecosystems is ectomycorrhizae. Um, again, this is a fungal plant symbiosis. And you can see a picture here. There's a little photo down there on the left-hand side. Um, this is something that you can see on plant roots. It's often on trees, <coughs> excuse me. 
and the fungal network is actually coating the whole outside of the root system. Some of these ectomycorrhizal symbioses actually lead to mushrooms or truffles. So this is something that you might actually, it's a little more visible actually. All we see are the little mushrooms popping up, but actually under the soil, there's a huge network of hyphae and that hyphae is connecting to the tree. And again, in exchange, the, the fungal network is gathering nutrients and in exchange, the plants providing carbon. So I mentioned before, this is actually really very common. It's much more likely for a plant to form this symbiosis than not. Um, so more than 80%, probably more than 90% of all plants on land, they don't just actually have roots, they have mycorrhizae. So myco being fungi and rhizo being root. So when we think of plant roots, we really should think of, of mycorrhizae. <clears throat> and actually this is, um, it's been said by other people that this, we might consider this the first World Wide Web so this is a plant and a fungi connecting, but actually it's not just limited to one plant and one fungi. These same fungal network can be connecting um, multiple plants together in an ecosystem. So here you can see many different trees and small herbs being connected by a, a fungal network. And um, we're now finding out how important this network is for the exchange of signals between um, neighboring plants. <clears throat> So I've just got a little video here, which comes from a course that we run at university, which I'll mention a bit later. The sound is a little quiet on this, so you may need to turn your volume up, but it just uh, gives you an example of some of these things uh, in the real world. And here you can see another mushroom. Um, so this is another fungi here that's breaking down that organic matter. This is just the fruiting body we can see. And lots of the hyphae are spreading out, breaking down the material. But what we can see over here is another really interesting fungi. This is something you may have seen in your own garden. These little fairy red mushrooms growing underneath an oak tree, often you'll see them under a birch as well. The reason they're growing under the tree is they're actually forming a symbiotic relationship with that tree. So these are just the fruiting bodies of the fungi. Actually down under the soil, that fungi, those fine fungal hyphae are actually spreading out into the soil and then actually connecting up into that tree. And these two organisms are uh, exchanging nutrients. So the fungi is gathering nutrients for the plant and in exchange the carbon fixed in the plant is being funnel to the fungi. So I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more about this a bit later. And here you can see another mushroom. Sorry, um, that's so just starting again. I'll just stop that. Breaking down that organic matter. Mm -hmm. This is just the fruiting. So this is actually part of the Backyard Biodiversity, just a little cheeky plug for the university. It's a, a free online course um, if you're interested in this kind, learning a little bit more about this kind of thing. So an interesting kind of aspect to this is that um, that these signals that are really important to, to invite a partner in, um, the plant invites the mycorrhizal partner in, something that they really um, need for their survival. Um, anything that's been um, an ancient signal like this, it's been around for a long time, you can imagine something's ready to take advantage of that. And actually we um, initially, strigolactones, these signals were discovered because they, they weren't discovered initially for their really important role in mycorrhizae. They're actually initially discovered because they attract parasitic plants. So we can think of the parasitic plant kind of crashing the party, or the plant and the fungi are, are having a little party with the strigolactone as the signal to help them. Parasitic plants we now know can actually take advantage of this. So they've actually taken, they've hijacked that plant signal and they attract, that are there to attract fungi and they actually use them to detect that a plant host is nearby and that germinates, stimulates the germination of that parasitic um, seed. Parasitic uh, weeds might not be something that we're that familiar with in Australia, but in, in some places, particularly in Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, they can have a huge impact on plant growth. So at the bottom there, you can see a sorghum plant with a purple, with another little plant growing out of it with these beautiful purple flowers. So that beautiful purple flowers are actually a parasitic plant and that plant is sucking the nutrients out of the host plant. And you can see a field of what should be filled with green sorghum is actually full of parasitic plants. And it can actually result in 100% crop losses in some places. So research is sort of currently underway to try and understand. Now we know that this signal, the strigolactone signal, which is, can be really beneficial for mycorrhizal symbioses, can actually be detrimental and attract parasitic weeds. So our researchers are now trying to understand how we balance that. And they've come up with some really um, interesting solutions, looking at um, when they're breeding plants to maybe produce a slightly different mixture of strigolactones. So ones that uh, attract, still attract mycorrhizal fungi, um, but actually uh, don't attract 
the parasitic plants. So this this is some current research, not, not nothing that I'm doing myself, but it just shows a real world kind of application for some of this information um, that, that we're finding out. So I mentioned that mycorrhizae is really an ancient symbiosis. So if we think about along the bottom there with millions of years ago, um, as plants moved from the water onto land and they had to form roots to um, take up water and nutrients rather than being able to just take it up directly when you're in the water. We think that that's how long ago they actually started to form these relationships with um, AM, you can see there as arbuscular mycorrhizae. Going all the way through to today, uh, where most plants still retain that relationship. So um, what I'm going to talk to you now is about is actually this other symbiosis I mentioned at the beginning, which is nodulation. And it, it might not initially seem obvious that there would be a connection between a, fun a relationship between a fungi and a relationship that just some plants have with bact nitrogen fixing bacteria. But actually we now know after the last few years that they're actually intimately connected. And that's because, as I mentioned, uh, if we, this is just a cladogram showing um, how plants have evolved and um, radiated out. Um, that actually as plants moved onto land, they formed these relationships with mycorrhizae, which we talked about. But later, that same program, that toolbox that was in place to communicate with and accommodate the fungi, um, has actually been retooled by some species to communicate with and accommodate a bacteria, which is um, really fascinating. So we can think of, of, of mycorrhizae as being like a grandmother for nodulation. So if we just blow up part of this and think about some species have actually gotten rid of the mycorrhizal program, they've decided maybe it's not um, worth their time to put the energy into and they just collect the nutrients up directly. But other plants have actually taken this program and I'm going to talk about these now, these uh, legume species have retooled this uh, communication system um, to form a symbiosis with nitrogen fixing bacteria. And we know that's really important. Um, this nitrogen fixing um, ability is a really important um, aspect of legumes that we take advantage of um, in agriculture. So what is nodulation? It might be something people are a little more familiar with than the mycorrhizal symbiosis, but it's actually quite limited. So it's only found in legumes with one exception. So when we think of legumes, we think of peas, beans, lupins, um, even some native, um, native uh, legumes as well. Um, so there's a symbiosis with, it's a symbiosis with rhizobium soil bacteria. So these bacteria are really special because they can take nitrogen out of the air because the blue sky, the beautiful blue sky you can see behind me, that's because it, the, the atmosphere is full of nitrogen gas, but we can't take up nitrogen that way and neither can plants. They can only take it up in a form, a uh, fixed form of nitrogen. So these bacteria, invade the root and the plant actually builds them a little house. You can see these ball-like uh, structures. Inside those little structures on the roots, the bacteria are living and they're fixing atmospheric nitrogen into a form that the plant can use. So you can see fields of peas, like we grow up in Northern Tasmania, um, that, that's um, actually, they're nitrogen rich because the, the um, bacteria is allowing that nitrogen to be fixed and uh, uh, transported into the plant tissue. So this just shows you in detail, kind of on a microscopic level, what's actually happening. So if we can think about the bacteria out in the soil and the plant growing alongside, again, there's, there is actually some communication going on between those two. And I'm gonna talk a bit about that. That's something we've been interested in understanding. Again, how do the two partners in this relationship talk to each other and decide that this is gonna be a good relationship for them? And then you can see the bacteria shown in blue here, which is it's not actually blue, but it's just, show, it's just a staining technique where we can see the bacteria. The bacteria is actually taken up into little root hairs and the plant actually builds this nodule. And we're really interested in all of those different steps about how the plant does all these steps. And ultimately leading to a nodule where the nitrogen can be fixed um, out of the atmosphere and funneled into the plant. And in exchange, uh, the plant is providing carbon. So very similar to what we talked about with mycorrhizae, but in this case, nitrogen being the really important. And again, the plant's paying for this in carbon. So it's beneficial to both partners. So this is just another little video that kind of shows you uh, nodulation because you can actually see nodules in your own garden. And this is from um, Science of Gardening. So um, with my handy assistant here, I've dug up um, a bit of this plant. So this is a, a lupin, which is a legume. 
And you can particularly tell it's a legume because when you pull it up, you'll actually see on the roots these little round structures here. Now these are called nodules, so these are actually plant structures. But the plant has uh, grown these structures so that inside the bacteria can live. So there's a bacteria that can live in the soil, but when it finds its own, uh, the plant that it likes to associate with, the plant will actually communicate with that bacteria and then they will um, actually take the bacteria up inside and build it a little house. So I'm just going to cut one open. And you can see inside the root there, you can see that very red colour there. Now that's actually a special um, protein that the plant produces called leg haemoglobin. So haemoglobin you'd be familiar with is the red pigment in our blood which binds oxygen. So this leg haemoglobin is a plant uh, protein and it binds oxygen as well but actually binds it to get it to actually uh, remove it from um, the environment in which the bacteria live. Because when these, ba these bacteria take nitrogen gas from the air they actually don't like to use, ox they, they need a low oxygen environment to fix that nitrogen into a form that the plant can use such as ammonia. So um, you'll know that your plants are healthy and fixing nitrogen and helping your soil if you cut open one of these structures and you can see that they're nice and pink inside. So you can imagine when we cut these plants down, the plant, the shoot and the root material and we dig them back into the soil, all that good nitrogen that's been fixed, we've now um, added back into the soil. So when you now plant another plant, that plant will benefit from that nitrogen. And you've done that naturally without having to add any fertilizer. So, um, with my handy assistant here, I've dug again, up. Um... So again, another little cheeky plug, but that's um, from Science of Gardening. And, um, UT has another free online course um, if you're interested in really understanding the science behind gardening. So we're interested in looking at nodulation, not just because it's um, useful for legume crops, um, which are nitrogen rich that we eat, and also like in that shot, we might dig nitrogen um, fixing crops back into the soil, like a, a sort of natural crop rotation. But imagine if we could actually think a little bit beyond that. What if we could um, move nodulation into staple crops? So things like rice, wheat and corn, none of those are legumes. Uh, and when we want them to grow, we, we do have to provide an external nitrogen fertiliser. But imagine if we could get them to form a relationship somewhat like what we see in legumes with a nitrogen fixing bacteria, that would have it would be a huge boon. We could actually then be getting the nitrogen gas out of the air rather than uh, having to add that fertiliser. So some of the research we've been doing is trying to understand the genes and the signals that are required, what, what makes legumes special, why, what genes and signals are important in forming this relationship. And actually um, the connection between mycorrhizal symbiosis and nodulation, like I mentioned to you, is that we actually know that there is some crossover. So when plants form the relationship with bacteria the, um, in legumes, they didn't reinvent the wheel. They actually, we now know, they used a lot of the same signals and genes that were already in place, this toolbox that was in place to form a relationship with fungi. They actually retooled some of those genes um, and signals to um, form the relationship with, with bacteria. So the more we know about what's similar and different between nodulation and mycorrhizae, uh, the more tools we have at our disposal to potentially um, this sort of holy grail idea of putting nodules onto staple crops. So one of the things that we've been working about is um, trying to understand is do plants, do plants use the same signals to attract the bacteria as, as they do with mycorrhizal fungi? We know they, there's some similarities in how they uh, communicate with these two. So one of the, the things that, that I've been looking into is uh, are strigolactones, that signal that I talked to you about at the beginning that we know plant roots are putting out to attract the mycorrhizal fungi. Could that also be important for attracting uh, the bacterial partner? So in this case, a pea plant, which can form both mycorrhizae and nodulation. We know it's exuding strigolactones. Could they be attracting the bacteria? So one way we actually look at these sort of relationships, and it's a real basis for the sort of work that I've been doing, is by using mutants, which might sound a little strange. But when we talk about a mutant, it's just a, a plant which is just missing just one gene. And the fact that it only misses one gene, we can then test, well, what does that gene do? We take that one gene away and we look at the, and we compare it back to what we call the wild type, which has that gene. So we could think of it in a kind of relationship context. We've got our wild type, tall, dark and handsome. Um, and then we have our strigolactone mutant, a plant which can't make strigolactone at all. And we can ask the question, would a plant still form a relationship with this? Um, little individual. So you can see there are some differences in the way these plants develop. 
um, in terms of their shoot development, their roots, but we're really interested in knowing whether if we take that signal away, does that have some effect on the ability for them to attract the bacterial partner? So to do these experiments, we have our mutants as our really great tool that we've got with and without strigalactones. And we basically add our uh, mutant to a wild type seed and we add our bacteria into a pot and we grow them and then we look at how those plants develop. And we do lots of replicates because we would never rely on a single plant because each plant, although genetically maybe is identical, um, there's always some variation. So we have lots of pots of wild type, lots of pots of our mutant, add the bacteria and then we grow them and pull them up after some time and see, what, see what's happening in the roots. So this is a kind of the, the first sort of um, data diagram that I've shown you. Um, but what it, we can just look on the left hand side, we've got our wild type and we've got our, which we're calling our RMS1, it's a mutant that, that lacks strigolactone. And the top panel there is you can actually see some nodules, um, those little bumpy structures on the root. So although our strigolactone mutant can make nodules, there are still some nodules there, they're definitely making less nodules than the wild type. And that panel you can see on the right hand side, um, we're measuring how many nodules are found on each root. And you can see that the RMS1 plants in the blue, when we don't do anything, they certainly have less nodules, probably half as many nodules. So definitely not having strigolactone seems to be doing something. And in the pink panels there, you can see we've actually added synthetic strigolactone back and we can actually do that, which is another little tool we've got for research. So pour the strigolactone back on, the thing that we, we know is missing in the mutant, and we can actually up the number of nodules in both cases. So it seems to be strigolactones are doing something in the way that the, um, to, to influence the ways plants uh, uh, interact with this bacteria. So if we think of it in a simpler term, um, we've got our strigolactone mutant, which can't say anything, there's no strigolactones there, and the bacteria is sending its signal. There's certainly some um, trouble communicating. So strigolactones do seem to be important for this, this communication between the plant and the, and the bacteria. We're not really sure exactly what is happening with um, the bacteria. I'm not a bacterial expert, um, but I've been uh, working with a colleague, uh, Maria Soto in Granada in Spain, and I was really lucky to visit um, Maria's lab last year. And you can see us there looking at a little plate full of bacteria. So we're looking at the moment to try and understand what might the strigolactone signal be doing. Maybe it's influencing the way the bacteria move or attach to the plant. So that's a current sort of area of research. So the last um, thing that I'll talk about and something that we've been spending some time on is the idea, is more symbiosis better? So can you have too much of a good thing? I've told you how beneficial symbiosis is, both mycorrhizae and nodulation. It's very beneficial for the plant. The plant can get access to nutrients it would never have access to otherwise. Um, but it, in most relationships, it's give and take and um, you can certainly tip the balance where too much symbiosis is actually a detrimental to the plant. And that's because the plant is providing carbon. So this doesn't come for free for the plant. The plant's fixing carbon for itself and it actually has to give that carbon, part of that carbon over to the, to the bacteria or the fungi. So it's really only when that balance is absolutely right that the plant's benefiting. If it tips too far in the other way and more symbiosis is forming than is actually beneficial, um, that's certainly detrimental to the plant. And that's actually an area that we're spending a lot of time on at the moment is actually trying to understand how plants balance that relationship and make sure that it doesn't slip into something that's, that's really negative. So we, we call this um, process of how plants control the amount of symbiosis is called autoregulation. So the plants are monitoring how much symbiosis that they have and actually uh, regulating that. Um, so only so much and then the plant will suppress. So you can see a picture here of actually uh, on the, the far left hand side a, a wild type plant which can control the symbiosis and this in this case it's nodulation and on the bottom panel you can see the roots with the little ball like structures the nodules. So you can see on the far left hand side that's a wild type which can count how many nodules it has and decide thank you that's enough no more. But on the right hand side we've got a mutant which can't control how much symbiosis it's forming. So it's got, it's sort of lost the quality control. It, the nodules just keep forming, keep forming, keep forming. And you can see that um, that's really not great for plant performance. So this is a really good example of more is not necessarily better. Um, so you've got lots more nodules forming, kind of almost strings on a pearl, like on a pearl necklace almost. 
and you can see the shoots are really suffering. So all that carbon is being funneled to the symbiont and the plant is certainly not benefiting. So we've looked into whether the idea that whether the strigolactones might be important for this. We know it's a calling card to interact with both the bacteria and the fungi. Um, we know that on the bacterial side, um, it doesn't seem to be important. So this is not the way plants are controlling how much symbiosis they are when they interact with the bacteria. Um, and we've done that again using these mutant studies that I talked to you about. So um, that's something we're, also, we're still looking into whether strigolactones are important for this uh, balancing the relationship with the fungi. And that's something else we're still looking into at the moment. So this is a little bit more of a technical slide, but it's just um, to get across the idea that there's a relationship, like we found, I mentioned before, that mycorrhizae and nodulation are related. There's some overlap in the genes and signals that regulate them. And studies in legumes like peas have taught us a lot about what are the similarities and differences between these two. And what we're interested in at the moment is figuring out uh, in terms of how plants control how much symbiosis they have. Do they use the same signals and uh, genes to control nodulation as they do mycorrhizae? Again, we know probably plants had a way of controlling mycorrhizae in um, yeah. all the way back when they first evolved this symbiosis. They would have had to balance that, make sure that they didn't get too much. Um, and now more recent studies, we've figured out that actually there is an overlap. So this is a little diagram on the right hand side and hopefully it's sort of effective. You can actually take a plant and split the roots into two different pots. And you can actually do different things to different sides of the root. And that can tell you a lot about how the plant's balancing its whole growth. So we know that if we apply the fungi on one side, we can actually suppress nodulation on the other and that actually, and vice versa. So we can nodulate one side of the root system and we can suppress uh, the fungal relationship on the other. So the fact that one will regulate the other suggests that there's some overlap in the system. The plants are using the same system to decide whether they want mycorrhizae or whether they want nodules. So this, in legumes, that's taken us quite a long way in our understanding of how do plants control this symbiosis. But if we, had, if we ever wanted to get to this holy grail idea, if we ever wanted to make a non-legume nodulate, so something like wheat or corn, one of the staple crops, it's not just enough to make nodules, it, we would need to control how many nodules were made. So that's a really key point. It's not just that they don't make nodules, but they would need to make the right amount of nodules that would be beneficial. So we really want to know, um, we know a lot about what's happening in legumes that, that do have nodules and mycorrhizae, but what we don't really know is um, what's happening in non-legumes to control mycorrhizae. Um, and it's important to move into a non-legume system because we really want to know, maybe they already have a toolbox in place to control mycorrhizae and maybe that could be retooled to control nodulation. Again, if these, if these two systems are quite similar, maybe it's not so much of a stretch to think we could actually um, find the tools already in plants. So in this case, we've moved into tomato as a system, as a non-legume system to understand how do plants control mycorrhizae and how might those genes be similar or different to some of the things we know about that are happening in legumes. So this, um, it, it's, we've come about it in a kind of a strange way, but um, we found um, there were some tomato mutants, again, mutants, which are just missing single genes, which don't, which um, have a hard time controlling how many petals they form. So when we look at the number of petals that are formed in um, these different mutants, you can see wild type up at the top um, there, which have five petals generally. And we've got three different mutants here with some sort of complicated names, which are not that important, but all of them form more, um, more organs than they would normally, more petals. So they kind of lose count of how many petals and it actually affects the fruit development as well. So this doesn't seem like an obvious connection, but um, we had some good reasons to think that these genes, which sort of count petals, maybe are important for counting how much mycorrhizae the plant makes as well. So this is some work done by a PhD student, Cheng Li Wang, and he found that um, these plants which can't control petals also can't really control how much mycorrhizae they form. So it's a little bit of a, a busy slide, but if you just look um, all in all the slides, the white is the wild type, so the normal plant, and in the colored um, bars, these are the mutants, and they all consistently have more mycorrhizae. So along the the left-hand panel there, root colonization, that means how much of the root is colonized by the fungi. And you can see that consistently there's more in all those mutants. The plants are 
uh, got some problems in controlling how much mycorrhizae they have. So that's a real area of interest for us at the moment, delving deeper into that and really understanding um, the genes and signals important for that. And as I mentioned to you before, something um, we're trying to put all this information together, the things we learn about mycorrhizae and the things we learn about nodulation to really uh, understand what genes are essential for nodulation, how the nodulation evolve, and could we ever breed or engineer nodulation? Um, that's a really kind of uh, maybe a longer term goal, but it's certainly something that, that um, it's a possibility. So I just want to thank um, colleagues. I'm certainly not on my own doing this work. Um, I've had a fantastic colleague in Jim Reed um, since I've been in Tasmania. And we've got a picture here showing some past and present um, students and staff. So Erin McAdam worked with me on the uh, strigalactone story. And Cheng Lee and Kate and Peter are all current PhD students working on different aspects. And also Karen, um, a research assistant, who's doing some fantastic work with me at the moment. And I'll leave that now on to questions. Hello, Ace. Thank you for a really fascinating talk. Personally, I now understand why I see the fungi that I see in my own garden. And I'm sure that home gardeners, as well as plant scientists listening, have uh, many questions for us. So uh, people who'd like to ask a question, please find the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and type in the question. Uh, Eloise will be able to see them, I'll be able to see them, and I'll choose a selection of those questions to read out. So our first question today is, Eloise, you mentioned the World Wide Web of plants earlier. I've heard that plants might be able to send signals to each other using this web. For example, a herbivore eating plants nearby. Is this true? Mm. Yeah, that is true. It's really, it's not an area that I'm working in, but I'm, I just find that an incredible, um, and, and not so surprising, I suppose. This is something that plants have been connected by these fungal networks for probably millions of years. So um, they've, they've managed to use them to retool them to actually, as, as a communication system, like a, a massive World Wide Web. Um, so it's true that a plant that maybe is being browsed, or something's chewing on a plant here, it can actually send a signal through that fungal network to a nearby plant to actually warn it and say, um, you know, there might be some insects coming that are going to start munching and they can actually start uh, building up chemical defences or um, things like that. Another really interesting aspect um, is that we now know that carbon can actually be uh, shared. So neighbouring plants can actually be shuttling carbon back and forth between this network as well, uh, which is really fascinating because this really goes deep into the idea of a connected ecological networks of plants. Thank you, Eloise. I have to say I find that amazing and fascinating. So this hidden world of plants, there's obviously a lot for us to learn. Uh, another question. Um, you mentioned that you mentioned mycorrhizal symbiosis. The question, in addition to naturally fertilizing plants, what other benefits do mycorrhizal symbiosis provide to plants? Mm, I didn't go into that, but we now realize that it's not just nutrients, particularly with mycorrhizae. There's all sorts of other benefits that we think um, the plant is deriving. So we know empirically that plants with mycorrhizae are generally more tolerant to stress. So they're more able to resist drought, um, uh, abiotic stress, so things like browsing or um, cold stress, uh, also things like um, disease, they're actually more tolerant to, um, they're more able to um, positively respond to disease. So be, um, so we think maybe that's the plants are actually turning up their defense system slightly. So interacting with a fungi maybe just slightly turns the volume up on their um, defense systems, not enough to reject the mycorrhizal fungi, but just to kind of heighten its awareness of the fact that the fungi is nearby and that might be um, giving it some little protection, so sort of a priming response. Um, but this is a really active area of research that people are looking into as these other benefits that we could be thinking about that, that um, we could be encouraging in agricultural systems, encouraging mycorrhizae to get all sorts of benefits for plant production. Thanks, Eloise, that's fascinating. In your talk, you mentioned nodules and nodulation. And I've heard somebody use the term holy grail with regard to making non-legume staple crops nodulate. Could you explain a bit about that, please? Mm. Yes, yeah, so I sort of touched on that and it's something that um, we certainly write into grants and we're thinking about as a real, you know, as a real kind of end goal potentially. 
um, as we've understood now that these um, this overlap between mycorrhizae and nodulation, which like I say, wasn't, wasn't obvious in the past, but has become obvious if we sort of unpack these things. Um, so the idea is not so far fetched now, the idea um, that we could actually retool plants uh, because they maybe have already a lot of the, um, uh, the sort of hardware in them to interact already with this mycorrhizal um, partner. Like I say, all the major crops form mycorrhizal symbiosis. Um, maybe we could tweak or change that a little bit to um, allow uh, nitrogen fixing bacteria also. Um, and there's some really amazing work going on um, looking at um, nitrogen fixing bacteria that do associate with um, staple crops in the field and actually looking to maybe just 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 turn the dial a little bit on that to make that an even more intimate relationship where the crop could benefit from these nitrogen fixing bacteria. That's really fascinating. Thank you, Eloise. Another question, do the bacteria actually move to the plants or are the bacteria just everywhere? No, they are mobile, that's right. So um, we think that the bacteria, have, they've actually got little flagella so they can actually swim. And we think these chemical messengers that I was talking about, they're kind of sending, it's like a gradient. So you can imagine close to the root that they're very concentrated. And as you move away from the root, these chemical signals get um, lower in concentration. So we think what's happening is the bacteria is actually sensing that concentration gradient and they're actually moving, actually swimming towards the plant. Um, and we've been interested to look whether the strigolactones might actually be um, kind of activating a swimming response in the bacteria. Um, the, the bacteria certainly are everywhere um, to some extent, but with the bacteria and the plant, it's actually a, more of a one-to-one -one relationship. So um, that bacteria, if you've grown that plant in the past, probably that bacteria is around. Sometimes it's even present on the seed already. Um, the mycorrhizal fungi is much more, um, uh, I don't want to use the word promiscuous, but um, one fungi can form relationships with probably hundreds of different plant species. So it's not something you need to add to the soil. The, the mycorrhizae is, is sort of everywhere, um, but you can certainly encouraging it, encourage it by doing different sort of uh, practices. That's really interesting. Thank you, Eloise. I have a question from a home gardener and then a final question. So question for, from a home garden or small farm perspective. Is there a known tipping point of how many rotation crops of legumes you can grow and plough back into the soil to increase your nitrogen, i.e. is once a year sufficient or is there a point where it's too much? Hmm, too much, I suppose. Yeah, I'm not an agronomist, so I probably couldn't give you the absolute right answer. I suppose it's not, it's not for free. I mean, when you grow a legume crop, although they're adding nitrogen soil into the soil, if you dig that back in, they're certainly still uh, consuming other nutrients in the soil. So there probably would be a sweet spot, I imagine, where you would, you would reach a certain level of nitrogen in the soil, which would be beneficial to the next crop, um, but it wouldn't necessarily, like anything, it'd be a balance between what the next crop might need. So, um, yeah, I mean, I certainly grow a, a cover crop every winter and grow legumes in that cover crop. So that's once a year. But um, I think an agronomist would probably give you a more precise answer. But um, I, I think it's just always this balance of um, certainly adding some nitrogen into the soil that way is really beneficial. And the carbon, obviously, that you're adding to the soil when you dig in any kind of cover crop. Mm. Thanks, Eloise. And a final question about using legume crops as green fertilisers. Could we increase the amount of nitrogen they fix by increasing the number of nodules they produce? Mm. Yeah, that's a really good question. And it kind of touches on that, that idea of what we've been looking into um, like I say, if, you, if, you, if the plant loses control of how many nodules it makes, you certainly uh, get a detrimental effect on plant growth. So there's certainly a tipping point where too many nodules is definitely not beneficial. It could be that we could be optimising the number of nodules. Um, so, and, and that's really probably a space that we haven't explored in breeding. Um, so a lot of legume breeding hasn't really focused on nodulation because we've generally grown them under conditions of high fertiliser. So I think that's a real space for future research of looking whether we could be, uh, we breed crops for all sorts of purposes, bigger seed or taller or shorter or more branched, but because roots are underground and these things are a bit hidden, um, it, it really hasn't been a focus of breeding. So I do think there could be some room for, for optimising that in our, in our uh, agricultural um, crops for sure. Mm. Thank you, Eloise. And just one more thing someone was curious about, when you're growing plants in experiments, do you grow them out in the field or in a lab environment? 
No, we do grow everything uh, generally in the glass house. So we're dealing with large species uh, like peas and tomatoes. So we're generally growing them in pots. Sometimes we grow them in even smaller situations, like in a kind of quite an artificial uh, sort of on um, agar plates. But generally it's in pots where we can control everything. We can control exactly what uh, nutrients the plants get, exactly what uh, microbial partner. So uh, generally, no, we don't grow in the field. But it would be nice to see this work eventually move into kind of um, a more agricultural setting where you would want to be doing field trials for sure. Mm. Thank you, Eloise. It's my pleasure now to hand the screen over to our Royal Society of Tasmania Vice President, Professor Jocelyn McPhee. Jocelyn is the chair of our Honours Committee and she'll pro propose a vote of thanks to Eloise. Thank you, Jocelyn. Thanks, Mary. Eloise, that was just plain terrific. You've obviously put a lot of effort um, into, into preparing your lecture and you've certainly been completely successful in presenting complicated information in a way that could be understood by people who are not specialists. And not only are we not specialists, we're not in the room with you. And that must add to the challenge speaking to a, a computer screen in an empty room. So um, on behalf of the people that you can't see and you can't hear, thank you. Thank you for all your time and effort. And also uh, congratulations on, on winning the Max Banks medal. Mm -hmm. So would you like to say a few words? Yeah, no, um, I would like to, yeah, no it's such an honour to receive the award and to speak to everybody today. So I was, I'm always really pleased to be able to speak to, about my research because yeah, I think it is, um, it, it's not hard to get excited about because it is, I think, a sort of fascinating topic of something that's going on all around us all the time. So hopefully it's given um, people a bit of insight into something that, yeah, is literally under their feet. So thanks so much for the award. I'm really, really honoured. Thanks. Thank you, Eloise. Would you like to move on to the concluding slide, Eloise? Thank you. So to all of um, our listeners today, we're very pleased that you're able to join us. If you have any feedback on this lecture, please email it to our Royal Society address that's on the screen in front of you now. And if you have any more specific questions for our speaker today, or if anything occurs to you a little bit later on and you think, I wish I'd ask that, please email it to Eloise at her UTAS email address, which is on the screen now. And in about a week, this lecture will be on our Royal Society YouTube channel for you to view and for you to pass the uh, link on to friends and colleagues who may have been interested in today's lecture but weren't able to see it at this particular time. And our Royal Society web address is on the screen, rst.org.au. On that, on that website, you will also find details of the awards that the Royal Society is offering this year. Uh, and we, this year we are offering the Peter Smith Medal. That's for early career researchers. And that's our newest award. It's only been awarded once. So if you know any outstanding early career researchers in Tasmania in any discipline, uh, please encourage them to get nominated for this award. I'd like to thank all the Royal Society members who helped preparing this webinar and also with promoting the webinar. We're very pleased that you can join us. You could join us today. Thank you for your attendance. Thanks, everyone.